I think if you can start getting in the mindset that this stuff is here, you can feel however you want to feel about it, but you're going to have to adapt to it. And there are really positive outcomes you can start adapting to. I think that's probably step one. Welcome to the AI for Creative Entrepreneurs podcast. I'm Kira Hug, co-founder of the Copywriter Club. And on this show, my co-host Rob Marsh and I focus on helping you stay ahead of the curve. We'll show you how to use AI to maximize your creativity, simplify your work in life, and reinvent your creative career so AI works for you, not against you. Join us as we explore the intersection of AI, creativity, and career. With hundreds of new AI tools launching every week, it's hard to keep up with all the possibilities and opportunities out there. But today's guest, Mike Caput, Chief Content Officer at Marketing AI Institute, is helping creatives and entrepreneurs navigate this ever-changing landscape. In this episode, we'll explore how quickly everything is changing in AI, the best ways for businesses to move from experimentation to integration, and the shifting roles and mindsets required as AI transforms marketing and content creation. Mike does a great job of demystifying the different models and the capabilities gaining the most traction. He also talks about some of his go-to tools and how we can all embrace AI while safeguarding against the risks. But before we jump into that interview, this podcast is sponsored by AI for Copywriters and Creatives. It's a course that we've developed that's helped more than 200 copywriters, content writers, and creatives learn how to use AI as a creative partner in their businesses. We created this course to help you confidently use different AI tools in your writing, in your research, in your strategic thinking without losing your voice and style. This course includes dozens of lessons that are over the shoulder demonstrations. So you can actually see how to use these different tools in action. And it also includes updated list of 100 of the best writing tools. So you'll know how to make these tools work for you. And we keep that list regularly updated, even though really hundreds of new tools come out every single day. At the end, you'll have the opportunity to be certified as a prompt engineer, which is a really great way to demonstrate your new AI abilities when talking to clients and prospects. You can get started with this course by going to thecopywriterclub.com forward slash AI for C. Okay, let's jump into the interview with Mike. All right. So Mike, why don't we kick it off? You know, to me, you're a familiar voice. I listen to the podcast you co-host with Paul Ritzer, the Marketing AI Show, and Paul was also a guest on this podcast. So I'm familiar with you and your brilliance, but can you just introduce yourself as far as like, what type of work are you doing in AI right now? Sure. So my name is Mike Caput. I'm the Chief Content Officer at Marketing AI Institute, and we're basically a company that makes AI approachable and actionable for marketers. So we do that in a few different ways. We kind of run some events, we have online education, and we kind of run our own media company, essentially providing content and resources to marketers and business people that want to understand AI. So our whole story really quick is we spun out of a marketing agency. So way back in the day, Paul Ratzer, our CEO and founder, used to own an agency. I worked on the leadership team at that agency for about a decade. And as part of our work, kind of growing, you know, a content marketing, inbound marketing focused agency, we we're actually HubSpot's first ever agency agency partner, we were looking into different technologies to grow our business, grow clients' businesses, and AI quickly became kind of an obsession of Paul's way back in 2012. And I kind of jumped on the obsession train a year or two later with kind of what I was reading and learning about it. And we spun working AI Institute out of that business as its own separate company in 2016, way back before kind of chat GPT and everything, as we were sharing what we were learning, what tools we were using, what approaches we were taking to applying AI to our business and to marketing as a whole. So I've been involved in Marketing AI Institute since day one or before day one. Um, 
in various roles. But today, really, I'm in charge of kind of growing and scaling our audience online. So I do that through any any number of kind of content marketing activities, um, you know, blogging, website, webinars, uh, demand gen, things like that. We produce a lot of in-depth content assets. I do a ton of speaking now on the road. So I'm really in charge of creating any and all content that helps our audience in different verticals understand AI better and then share also my knowledge of how I'm experimenting with and applying AI to content marketing workflows in my own role. And then, you know, we're a small startup too. So I wear a hundred other marketing and sales hats as well. So I want to start with a, a really big question, Mike, before we started recording, we were talking about how quickly everything is changing in the AI world and, and things we were talking about four months ago, or, you know, in some ways very different today. Where do you see the biggest changes, opportunities, uh, you know, um, things happening in the AI world that entrepreneurs, creative writer, writers, creatives, designers, you know, should be thinking about and, and really paying attention to? That's a really good question. With the caveat that this could change next week. Um, yeah, for I, sure. Yeah, well, we, we might have to re-record again in December yeah, and do it all right. over again, right? Yeah, I could be wrong seven days from now, but I think as of today, I would say first off, you have to figure out how to solve in one way or another in the context of your business a role for generative AI of multiple types. That is obviously the word or phrase on everyone's lips these days since chat GBT. I still think despite all the hype around that, very few people have really gone beyond experimenting with the tools, which is great. But I think we're really going to see in the next hopefully six or 12 months, really robust workflows, processes, and even entire new like lines of business and services built around generative AI tools. So I think that's one big one. I think kind of broadly in the space, it's really interesting to track the open source movement within AI, where we now have the ability to essentially download, run, and fine tune really powerful models. I don't know if that's going to matter for your individual copywriter or marketer say, and they might be experimenting with that. You certainly don't have to, but it'll have a bigger impact on the ecosystem. We're going to see really, really fast innovation in these large language models that have to date really enabled generative AI capabilities. So definitely keeping a pulse very closely on generative AI uh, in general, but I'd also say we're just headed probably towards in the next 12 months, really more robust operationalizing of AI tools. I think we're going to start to finally see people really transforming how they do business, even by just incorporating deeply a few of these tools. What would that look like for freelancers, you know, more creative freelancers, content writers like yourself? What would that be, you know, a step beyond the experimentation using ChatGPT? Yeah, it could look like a few things. So first, I think beyond experimentation, you're going to look at what you're already doing, right? And you probably want some type of very robust process map of like, we literally are daily creating like step by step checklists for everything we do, even if it sounds like a really big slog or like kind of too granular, really just mapping out what am I actually doing? What are the steps? And you know, sometimes there's gaps, you don't always do everything the same way. But we want to have process maps so we can start to say, oh, hey, that AI tool we just covered, we might want to slot that in for the podcasting workflow or part of that or the copywriting workflow for the blog or for social. So I think looking at what you already do is step one and getting really, really smart and really robust about what that actually looks like in the, a day-to-day -day context as you're doing it today. Then you can start really slotting in you know, it's even different capabilities of the same tool, right? Something like Claude 2 from Anthropic can do 101 different things. And if you really know how to use it, it's more you want to then know what should I be applying it to. And so that's where that process map of whatever you're doing from a copywriting or creative context can really be helpful. Now, I think beyond that, which is where we're just getting into, and it's very speculative, is you probably need to start doing some soul searching about how does my business model or how does my role change because of this stuff? I'm not, a, I don't personally subscribe to the opinion that AI is going to suddenly get rid of 
copywriters or anything like that, but it's going to change the economics of some things you do. It's going to change the value placed on certain tasks. It's going to increase the value of some, devalue others. That's all kind of really speculative on so far, I would say, but I, I do think that's worth asking some hard questions about and starting to think about. So I know you're uh, you, you're sort of becoming an expert in a lot of these tools. Uh, you know, as, at a really general level, when we look at the basic LLMs, the different models, uh, ChatGPT and OpenAI and Claude, and uh, I, I know there's two or three others that are really popular. Bard uh, happens to be one. What do you see the biggest differences between the different models as we start to play around with? these should we be going to one tool for a specific kind of feedback and and content generation versus another uh like help us work through some of the differences and what you're seeing yeah. that's a question that's on a lot of people's minds so i can share like how i think about it it may change if you're at a bigger company but like i said we're pretty small and kind of just trying to move really fast so we're really focused on the starting first from use cases and outcomes so we say what do we want to achieve that these models can help with. And then from there, we're, unfortunately, it's kind of this messy phase where you have to keep using four or five of them at the same time because they are, it's almost like a horse race, right? Some of them are pulling ahead a little bit, then someone else is pulling ahead. The capabilities are changing every day. So we are actively using four or five or six different models or tools for the same use case just to see where are we benchmarking. I don't think we're going to end up in a world where you're only using one, though you certainly could. Um, so it's not like a very clean answer here, but I would say we all on our team default towards the tools and models we really like, um, but they're generally doing often the same things. Now, I, per I have personal favorites and opinions on what I think today looks like it's more competent than others, but... I would say it really starts with you have these go-to use cases and you're continually trying out different models or tools built on top of them to achieve those use cases. So I will say from a differentiation perspective, I am more and more gravitating towards models or tools that have very, very large, like what they call context windows. So something like Claude 2, which I mentioned, I think the context window is like 100,000 tokens, which is like... 70,000 words, which means you can drop a book into it and literally query it, summarize it, extract passages from it as one particular use case. I find that really helpful because we do a lot of in-depth research reports. We don't want to read sometimes hundreds or dozens of pages at a time. So the large context window helps and that tool does a lot of other things that like ChatGPT Plus does, which I use all the time as well. So I kind of end up defaulting towards Claude 2 sometimes. Um, but yeah, that's just kind of how we're approaching it at the moment. It is just unfortunately a pretty murky and messy process as, as of today. What do you recommend if you recommend anything as far as the timing of testing? And I guess this just depends on when the new tools come out. But if you give yourself a month to test three or four different tools for one use case before you decide, okay, let's let's kind of commit to this one for now, or you, do you just leave the timing open to whenever you feel like you want to jump in? Yeah, so I'll be honest, ours is like a little fast and loose because we're kind of day by day, just like, okay, yeah. this works, let's go. Um, yeah. But we typically, especially when we're helping companies roll this stuff out more formally, we kind of like fall into this someone's like 30 90 rule which is like take 30 days to evaluate the tool um and then 90 days to deploy it fully if you're okay with the tool like after a 30-day trial period like give it 30 days trying to do something with it if you absolutely hate it okay get another one but if it looks like it's working then do kind of a full rollout with the team for 90 over 90 days or so and really take the time with one tool especially if you're a bigger team with one tool to get it right before you're using you know eight others and you can be experimenting as much as you want, but we found that to be really helpful because a lot of times too, like it's not just about let's prompt the tool or get the right prompt library to make this tool work really well. That's really important. But if you're on a team, it's more about like, okay, how can we be using this tool for everything? What are the processes around using this tool that we are using to support the team as they are going about it? And for a lot of people, 
the people on your team who aren't as geeked about, for instance, AI, it may take time to onboard them. They may need hand-holding. So we typically look at that as like, try something out for a month if you like it, pilot or integrate it over the next 90 days or so. So can I ask, uh, you, you mentioned Claude too, um, and that is obviously a, a great tool. Can I ask about, say, like your top five tools that you're using in you know the, the work that you're doing today, whether it's content yeah. creation or process management, what are the tools that you like and how are you using them? In, and if there's something that you're doing creative that you know is maybe sort of you know an off-label uh, application, I'd love to hear that too. But uh, yeah, just curious about the tools that you use and and how. Yeah, for sure. So one big one that we use actually before we even get started creating content is called Market Muse, and it's an AI-powered content strategy platform. So it basically gives us a lot of insights we wouldn't otherwise have into which topics we should even write about if we are trying to you know, rank for certain topics. Um, it will tell us how to write about those topics. If we uh, do want to create content around them, it will actually create uh, like AI powered SEO briefs for us, which we often use. And this is really helpful too, because you know today we create a lot of content off of our podcast, but we are still trying to look at how do we optimize existing articles and pillar pages on the site? Market Muse helps with that. How can we perhaps rank for a topic that um, our competitors would find harder to rank for? So it does personalized difficulty. Um, it will tell us based on our unique domain and topic expertise, we can actually find it easier to rank for a very popular keyword or topic that generic keyword research would not tell us was possible. So we've actually used that strategy to outrank the competition quite a bit. Um, so that's kind of a strategic tool that we use quite a bit. I would say specifically within ChatGPT Plus Code Interpreter, I think it's now called Advanced Data Analysis. They just renamed this feature where basically you can drop in data sets and have it analyze and create charts for you has been monumentally helpful. Like. In the last couple months, it saved me 30 hours of work alone because we do a yearly state of marketing AI report that actually just came out. Um, and as part of that, we do a survey that we got this year 900 responses to, to about 20 or so different questions. And none of it's super advanced data analysis, but parsing through all that data, creating all the charts for the report actually extracting insights from it used to take me dozens of hours every year we've done it in the past. Uh, I definitely went through line by line to check code interpreter this year, but it was able to do it in like an hour or two. So that was extremely valuable from that perspective. Um, I would say we are further experimenting and rely on pretty heavily AI features in a tool called Descript for our podcast. So this is audio and video editing. But what's cool is on top of that, they've got a bunch of new features they keep rolling out that are really interesting. You can actually create voice clones of the people talking so you can overdub pieces of the podcast without having to re-record it. That might sound a little creepy to some people, but it can be really useful. Uh, and then also they have something which we haven't used yet, but I find interesting. It will actually overlay over your eyes, um, like AI generated content. To that keep part is creepy. Camera. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we would use that, but I'm, I respect the fact they are it's cool. pushing out really interesting AI features as part of that tool. Um, so I think, what was that, three tools? Uh, so other tools that we use, Writer, writer.com is kind of a team AI writing platform that we also use definitely for some of the same use cases, I would say, as like a Claude 2 or a ChatGPT, but it is helpful to kind of have a common platform our team can jump into. And I'd like to leverage more the features that platform has around like standardizing your writing so you can actually build out essentially style guides, brand guidelines, things like that to keep everyone on the same page. Um, and then another one, fifth one that I love quite a bit is more used for like content research. It's called Perplexity AI. And it's kind of like you, I think you would get the same results from like a Google Bard or Bing where it's like generative 
AI search. So you search like you would for information and it provides, you know, conversational answers like paragraphs of text, but it does come with citations. So you can actually really quickly check interesting stats. And I've tested Bard and Bing as well, um, not as extensively, but in my opinion, they don't work nearly as well as perplexity. So that's really helpful because I can say, hey, I'm writing a post on 2023 AI trends in manufacturing. Could you give me 10 stats on this topic? Here's a little more context. And oftentimes it'll do a really good job of really quickly getting you information that you can then go check since often, you know, these tools hallucinate. So you have to always check that. Just a, a quick follow up on that. Perplexity is built on on the um, anthropic LLM. Is that right, or or am that I misremembering that? Because I, I remember seeing something about that being an easy way to start playing with that particular model. Um, and at least at least recently, it was free. I don't know if Perplexity is still free, but it was a, a way to do it for free. Uh, but I. Yeah. Could be wrong about that. Maybe you. No, maybe I think you know. you're right. There's a paid and a free version. I've only used the free one. And looking at it right now, when you upgrade to Pro, it upgrades you to Claude 2 or GPT 4. So perhaps, yeah, those are, you yeah. have the choice of the most advanced models as, if you upgrade, it looks like. So if somebody wants to play around with Claude, uh, that's an easy way to, to do it um, yep. before really committing and, and going all in with the subscription. Absolutely. All right, before I want to ask you about the state of AI marketing, because I just came out. But before that, before we move away from tools, I'm just curious, you know, what has maybe shocked you? Maybe that's too big of a word, surprised you. You're talking about different tools every single week on the podcast. And, you know, is there one that you were like, I, this is too much? There are probably many actually that were, are too much, but is there one where you're like, I, I can't, this is. So I, I'll say as a category of tool, one that I, I'm just confessing I have avoided diving into because it scares me a little is voice cloning or like generative AI for audio because I know for a fact it works really, really well. I've looked at plenty of examples of it working really, really well. And I'm like, uh, it's going to be only a matter of time before somebody clones my voice our CEO's voice. I mean, everybody. I'm going to do it. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so, and A, I just like hate listening to myself speak generally on video and audio, but um, I'm also just like, ah, oh, this raises so many problems, you know, just from a personal perspective. I'm like, there's going to be a very near future where you won't be able to tell if it's me on the phone or whatever. So that part, definitely, I, I didn't anticipate it being this good this quickly, but also... I think that's how AI works. You just have to get on board with it. <laughs> the dark applications to that scare me. I mean, you know, we ha we have hundreds of podcasts out there with our voices on it, and somebody yep. can take those and have our, you know Kira say things that she would never say, or me say things that I would never say. It's going to yeah. sound real, and the potential for messing with brands, you know, doing that kind of stuff, personal brands, is uh, it's scary. Um, I, I don't know if there's a, you know, like a way to inoculate against that either. You know, do you, do you put on your website, hey, we would never talk about these things. So if you see somebody talking about it, it's not us or you know, like, right. Yeah. How right. do you correct well, for that? Tick, like, you know, something where I'm like clicking every time I talk in the podcast. A safe <laughs> word. You need a, a safe, safe word. word yeah. like a phrase. I mean, it, it really is. It is scary. And, and it, I mean, it's, there's serious risk there, you know, with cancel culture, this stuff spreads faster than you can correct for it. Right. And if it's right. not true, like, you know, eventually people are still going to think that, you know, things are true. It, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm there with you. I think it's it, the dark side of that is really um, threatening in some ways. Yeah. And I think it's uh, it may sound a little sci-fi to say, but I don't think it's crazy to say that a lot of brands probably should have some policies or like at least information available to employees or plans for crisis communications if this stuff happens to you. Because today, 99.9% .9 of employees are not thinking about the fact they could get a call from a CEO saying, hey, can you go do X, Y, and Z with our bank account or our invoicing as a favor? And it would sound hyper-realistic. I mean, scams like that already happen with new employees, but you could be doing this with someone who's worked there 20 years now, and it would be 
very easy to do with off-the-shelf technology. So I think it would be helpful for employers to at least have just even baseline education of like, hey, here's unfortunately what is possible today. You might want to be on the lookout for certain nefarious uses of AI. Yeah, Rob, get on that. We got to get on that. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it occurs to me there's probably, you know, there's the certification process that websites go through, uh, you know, so it says, yeah, this is a legit, you know, website or whatever. There's probably mm -hmm. some kind of a thumbprint technology that you could attach to podcasts, video casts or whatever and click on it and say, yep, this is attached to the right certificate. Right. I know some of that stuff can be copied or cloned or whatever, but I, I can't imagine that. I mean, that's a massive business opportunity. Somebody's got to be working on it. And if they're not, maybe Kira, you and I should start putting something together for that because uh, it's going to be a need for sure. Yeah, I'm just thinking, yeah, in our in our extra time, sure, we will take that on. Uh, so, Mike, let's talk about the state of AI marketing and some, you know, it's a big report, but what do you feel like is most relevant to creative copywriters, content writers who are listening they should know or be aware of from that report? Yeah, so this is our 2023 State of Marketing AI report. So you can get it at stateofmarketingai.com. And basically, like I had alluded to when talking about Code Interpreter, we actually surveyed about 900 plus marketers on AI understanding and adoption. So it wasn't just for copywriting, though content marketing was an area that was very highly represented. Uh, we asked, like, what areas of marketing do you have a hand in? So you can select multiple types. Content marketing, 83% of people in some fashion are working on as part of these respondents. Um, I think what really jumped out to me are a couple things. So first off, if you are a copywriter or creator or marketer of any type and you have not gotten around to experimenting and seriously diving into AI, I, I always say people are not behind and I don't think you're behind as of today, but you will be very soon because we found like 98% of the people we talk to are using AI in some way. Now, a lot of them are just experimenting or dabbling still, but I was actually surprised that only 2% of people that we surveyed said they were not using AI. Now, like any survey, we're skewed a bit towards our audience, which probably inherently has more people using AI. But honestly, that stat is kind of anecdotally born, like born out to people I've talked to. I mean, I don't know many marketers who aren't trying to at least figure this stuff out. So I'd say if you haven't done that yet, it's probably good to start prioritizing this. Um, I was also pleasantly surprised to see that there was a dramatic rise in the number of marketers that said AI was a clear priority in their marketing for the next 12 months. So they said it was either very or critically important. There was like a 11 or 12 point jump there from last year alone. Um, I think really the big thing that always jumps out to me is this has been pretty consistent over the last few years, alludes to what we just talked about, which is companies, the vast majority of companies do not provide any type of AI education. So really a lot of marketers, copywriters, creators are kind of left out to dry by companies on how to actually start using this stuff. And, you know, a few years ago, I understood that it was still so early. This year, I would have expected that to change at least a little bit. I think next year we'll see huge movement in that. And that's kind of gaps we're trying to fill with our own education. But it's really going to be imperative that anyone, no matter how small an organization you're working at, provides or has access to some type of education around how to start actually applying AI to their work and how to use it responsibly, because there are so many ways we just mentioned, one of them, that this can go badly within an organization. You know, as I've, I've sort of scanned through some of the stuff that you put together in the report, uh, one of the things that jumped out to me is the number of people who classify themselves uh, you ask about their experience level with AI and classify themselves not as beginners, but mm -hmm. as intermediate users or even expert users, which, uh, you know, it, it, with the exception of maybe a couple of you guys who have been doing this thing for, you know, 10 years or whatever, there really aren't right. that many experts out here. Um, 
what do you think what do you think is is that is that marketing ego is it just simply because oh yeah well i've been doing it longer than you know 80 percent of america that has barely even you know heard of chat gpt like what goes into that and and is i mean aren't we all really just beginners i tend to think so personally um just because I know enough about AI to know how little I don't know. So I think that <laughs> you got to have a little humility around considering yourself a beginner versus advanced. But, you know, when, yeah, when it comes to saying, how would you classify your understanding of AI terminology and capabilities, to your point, like 54% of people said they were intermediate, which was definitely a rise from last year. I'm wondering how much of that is possibly a again some of the bias in our audience um you know ideally we do want to see that number go up if we're doing our job okay but i wonder also too we've seen this quite a bit there's a bit of a blind spot when it comes to the term ai that we often try to address in our consulting our workshops our speaking which is ai is not just generative ai it's not just chat gpt those are huge, huge pieces of it and really, really important. But I think we, we see so many very smart companies that are led by very competent people that are saying, oh, okay, you guys do AI. What do we do about chat GPT? What should our chat GPT strategy be? And we're like, okay, that's at least a good question to start asking. But what you need to realize is it's so much more than ChatGPT. That's the tip of the iceberg when it comes to AI generally as a category of technology and also what's possible. So that might be part of what's driving that too, is someone says, hey, I went deep on ChatGPT. I understand some of the emerging generative AI tools and what they're capable of. I feel like pretty comfortable with the AI landscape. And to be fair, they have a good understanding of generative AI, but it's not just that. So I wonder how many people are equating Gen AI with AI as a whole. Yeah, and I wonder how many of us intermediates, you know, are ready to start consulting. And you mentioned earlier creating new packages. You offer consulting through your your AI agency. So, what do you feel like is a prerequisite for creating that new offer, especially as you know smaller business owners, to say? I can help you at least figure out a couple AI tools to integrate into your business. You know, I'm wondering if it makes sense to specialize in one or two um, mm. and then kind of create a package around that and say, I can come in and help you with this specific tool and train your team and help you use it and create some deliverables there. What would you recommend? I think that's a really smart way to look at it. I do think the question I always arrive at for us as much as anybody is, which tools do you bet on? because there are so many tools being created every day. There are so many that die out, and we're probably going to see at some point some type of mass consolidation event, or a lot of capabilities that really cool tools today have are just suddenly going to be baked right into, say, Google Docs or Microsoft 365. So I think it's really hard to pick which one to bet on. If you can spin up an offer that's valuable relatively quickly, though, for some of the more popular tools, I think that makes a lot of sense because there are lots of customers out there that say, look, all we're using right now is Writer or Jasper or ChatGPT, whatever. How do we use it better? So I think that can be really valuable. I don't know the longevity of an offer like that, though. I Maybe it'll work really, really well for a certain uh, business owner for a long time. Um, I just, these move so fast, I would be really hard pressed to be like, aside from outside of a handful of tools, which ones would I bet, you know, my future revenue streams on? That is kind of a work in progress, at least on our end. So obviously we talk a lot about Gen AI. Uh, and as you mentioned, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Yep. Can you help us like reveal the rest of the iceberg? And I, I, a lot of us have a sense of some of the things that AI is doing outside, you know, that Netflix, you know, gives me the perfect thing to watch or that, uh, you, you know, some hospitals are using AI to you know, read x-rays better than doctors do. So clearly it's capable of doing some really amazing things, but show us, you know, chunks of the rest of the iceberg. What else is it doing, even if it doesn't necessarily apply to what we're doing in marketing so yep. much? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think really the 
rest of the body of the iceberg could be defined really broadly as prediction, right? These are prediction machines. And generative AI is just one way we found to start getting AI to predict really well what should be in an image or what should be in a language response. So that's prediction essentially for language and vision. But if you think about the nature of making predictions, really AI suddenly opens up to be this thing that can be applied to way, way more things. I mean, think about a self-driving car, for instance. It is using prediction in concert with a number of other data sources to predict what is an object, what's a person, what's a road, and using that in a bunch of different ways to be able to enable this whole different use case that can transform an entire industry. Now, that's just one extreme example, but if you think about it, I mean, you, the medical field was a great example here. How many things are we making predictions about in your average day in the healthcare system? It's not just, yeah, finding tumors in an x-ray. It's everything from patient churn to what disease or condition do you have? What is the most likely treatment? Every single industry on earth that has any type of knowledge work, and frankly, that has any type of physical work, is often making predictions as a core part of how value is created in that industry. So the real question then becomes, what data do you have to feed to different AI systems to help it make really good predictions since it's based on data? And until relatively recently in human history, we just haven't had enough data for these machines to be able to make really good predictions. Now, since the dawn of the internet, we've been generating more data than we know what to do with. So I think really the next phase we're going to see uh, beyond today and beyond generative AI is AI for everything, right? It is going to be, it's already in so many apps. You mentioned Netflix, you know, Amazon. It's been part of our lives for a decade in certain ways. We just haven't really seen it. Eventually, it will be everywhere. And I think the really core piece of this that ties these two areas together, the tip of the iceberg and the rest of it, is generative AI, like I say, is using predictions to create language and create visuals, for instance, or audio. But the other sneaky, useful part of large language models is they've now opened up language as a essentially a programming language. So now, instead of us having to learn how to code, we can actually now command these machines, get them to produce outputs, get all the other pieces of AI that will be baked into every other industry to do what we want, using kind of this source code that we all know, which is human language. So I think those two things together in the next decade or so are really going to prove to people, oh, this AI thing isn't just getting AI to write for us or to create art. It's this unlock for every other piece of artificial intelligence that's going to be, I mean, you name it, in the software, the hardware, and the physical world all around us. And when you say everything, like it can do everything, it does that mean human level AI? Is that, you know, the, the founder of Anthropic, is that what he's talking about? Or is that something different? Yeah. So when we talk about like human level AI, or you might hear a term like artificial general intelligence, AGI is something people okay. are worried about or building in some cases. That's a really vague term. I still haven't found like a perfect definition of it. But I think like in my head, the way I would think about that is an AI system that broadly does a bunch of things as well or better than a human without you having to essentially like train it as such. So I don't think that exists yet as far as I can tell. Um, that would be more of a sci-fi thing, I would say. We could very well get there soon. I don't know. But that today doesn't exist. But once you start getting either narrow AI, like narrowly defined use cases of AI everywhere, or AGI of some type, you're really going to see how this stuff can permeate every part of the you know physical and digital world. But today, I think a lot of Silicon Valley people are really hyped up on AGI and the potential of it. I, we're just not there yet. If we can get there at all, that remains to be seen. Yeah, this is uh, this is part of AI that I love thinking about uh, because you know, as you mentioned, narrow uses 
there are AIs that outperform humans in all kinds of things. You know, chess and Go, you know, it's actually been outperforming humans for de a decade, right? Where humans cannot beat the AI at games. But, uh, and we have seen, at least my understanding is we have seen some of the language models, you know, like teach themselves languages that they were not trained on. Uh, so some of that stuff does happen, but but it's that general application across everything. It's it ha uh, you know an LLM has not taught itself how to drive a car or how right. to turn on the power plant or how to replicate itself. You know out there, hopefully that stuff is is a ways off. You know the, the scientific or the the science fiction uh, of it all uh, you know, gets a little scary when we start to you know game it out. But um, yeah, I, this is the stuff that when it comes to AI, I, I love thinking about, I love seeing, you know, where it's advancing, where it's not, that's not even a question. Just me, just like kind of, <laughs> kind of like celebrating what you're saying. Here. Is that, well, yeah. it's, it's, it's so interesting to me. It's so fascinating. And honestly, when you were asking about what kind of scares me or what kind of jumped out at me, I, this is probably an area because when I got started in this space, I was a huge and still am a huge science fiction fan, have been since a kid, like will devour every science fiction book I can find. So like that was part of my fascination. I was like, oh, I've read about this stuff before. And then, you know, diving into it way back when I was like, oh, OK, I understand why people say this is never going to happen in some type of like AGI situation. And I've probably changed my opinion a little bit on that because the large language models, to your point, are why everyone's now talking about this. You know, three, four years ago, before this stuff was really everywhere, um, you're not seeing any AI system that can start learning stuff it's not supposed to know. And a large language model, you made a great example. They've taught, they've trained several models that were able to actually be quite proficient in languages they just were not trained on. Maybe that's just a function of human language, but that's where you start thinking, oh my gosh, what if we train it to do one thing and it's actually also really, really good at all these other unintended things? That's pretty interesting to me from an a innovation perspective. I mean, these are large language models are really that key piece to start deep diving on and understanding more to kind of see where some of this stuff is headed, I think. And I think we've seen lots of examples of that in biology. I mean, humans have evolved to replicate ourselves. And in the process of evolving and optimizing for that particular thing, we've developed all other kinds of things that we can do that are not necessarily part of you know, reproduction. And you know, if, if intelligence as a broad principle operates the same way, regardless of whether it's organic or digital, we could see, you know, a, a, an AI start to develop capabilities that we might not even be aware of, uh, things that it's doing that, you know, are well beyond, you know, a biological, um, you know, use case or whatever. Uh, uh, so, yeah, again, I, I just think this is fascinating to think about. It's a little scary sometimes to think about you know, what the possibilities are. Uh, but it's a lot. It's a lot. A but, honestly, a lot. But honestly, I think we need to talk about it, though, because if you just ignore that and say, oh, it'll never happen. Yeah. But, but and we ignore these little examples of things like, you know, this language learning stuff that's happening in a black box that we don't understand exactly what's going on. We risk not seeing more threatening uses coming up. And, you know, uh, I, I agree with some of the, I, I know I, I'm always the one that goes dark on these, uh, interviews. I try to, Bob, I try I, to off the dark part until I, the end of the episode. I feel like, I feel like, you know, <laughs> there so should be, phone. there should probably be some like universal pull the plug point, you know, where everybody <laughs> unplugs everything. Uh, but we haven't agreed where, you know, where that line is at, at that point. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go any darker than that. I think uh, that's probably, you know, turn, turn us around. <laughs> I, I love it too. Um, I want to go back though a little bit before we go too dark. Um, talking about roles, roles shifting for writers, marketers today. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess the question is like, how can we think about this metamorphosis and like how we can change and go from okay, today I'm a copywriter, but really three years from now, I probably need to be over here. So this is what I need to do to get there. And maybe these are the packages that will help me move along that trail. Like, how do you think about that? So 
think how I think about it is definitely evolving as some of this stuff gets really, really good at things I didn't anticipate it getting very, very good at. But I think first, really, it is critical to shift your mindset a bit. I mean, I think mindset is a huge barrier, rightly so, I understand. For a lot of people, they don't want to admit, they can't intuitively admit to themselves some of these outputs are in their own right from a machine creative or interesting or a pretty solid idea. Like we're at that point today and it's still day one. I'm sorry, like we could go down the rabbit hole on a philosophical debate, but machines can create creative outputs that are interesting. That's fundamentally true. And I sometimes don't like that. It might offend me and my creative sensibilities, but you just have to accept that. And I don't see that as a necessarily bad thing to be out in the world. I mean, it, on one hand, yes, machines can do some of the creative things we have spent a very long time getting good at ourselves. But on the other hand, machines are also opening up a huge amount of creative possibilities and unlocking new creative superpowers for everyone. Um, so I think if you can start getting in the mindset that this stuff is here, you can feel however you want to feel about it, but you're going to have to adapt to it. And there are really positive outcomes you can start adapting to. I think that's probably step one. And then, you know, step two, I think you probably want to start kicking the tires on your own business or role. I mean, we kind of consider this like, um, you know, like a role mapping we would do in terms of like consulting with an organization. It's like, what are what's involved in your team's roles and where could these roles go over the next two to three years, knowing what we know about AI? It comes down to you got to get that fundamental understanding of AI education and what it can do, what the opportunity is, and then start applying that knowledge to your own role. So if I'm a copywriter, I'm sitting down and probably saying, okay, what am I spending the most time on? What are the outputs? What's uniquely human about those outputs? Where is the value being created? And yes or no, can machines do some of those things today? And if the answer is yes, that doesn't mean necessarily strike it off your list of skills you've cultivated or sell or create value around. How can you and the machine working together create more value than you could create alone? I think that's going to take a lot of thought and a lot of maybe asking some hard questions, but I'd be looking more, how can you do what you do today as well in less time? And how does that affect your billing models, your revenue, um, or your value of your role? And how can you do things you couldn't do before by taking what you know and what a machine knows and making kind of the whole greater than the sum of those two parts? And I don't have like a perfect answer there, but you know, when it comes to content, some of the things we're thinking about quite a bit, we've moved away from probably more informative and helpful but generic content. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that approach in the past. We've really done a ton of that content to educate our audience and say, look, here's a comprehensive article on uh, AI for content marketing. Like Those articles do really well and there's a place for them, but that was a very large part of our strategy a long time ago. Now we've moved much more towards very human, not scalable kind of interesting point of view content. So the podcast that we do is a great example. That's something that really we've designed that only we can do it. Um, you could use a machine we do at every part of the process to make it much easier and faster and better, but you really can't duplicate our unique point of view and perspective in the podcast, at least today, until, you know, they start cloning us with AI. But um, that is one of those areas where I think content copywriting is really going to move into a much more emotional, more human area, um, because those will be the things, kind of perspectives that will be really, really hard for someone with a really powerful tool to duplicate or copy or do faster. So as we talk about this shift that's going on and how to position ourselves to benefit from it, I think one of the big comparisons people make a lot is, you know, the horse and buggy switch to the car uh, industry. And, you know, it's like, yes, a lot of horse and buggy drivers or, or horse breeders lost their jobs, but the car industry created, you know, all these other amazing jobs, uh, you know, at some point they become higher paying, uh, you know, the 
there you could argue things like even the pollution in some ways got better you know horse manure in the streets uh is uh every bit as bad as co2 in the air right like so there's all of this stuff that that changed i'm wondering where you're seeing these new jobs appear already and i know we're really early you know we we don't know what the ai landscape will look like in five years but where do you see uh you know let, let's say that you know some content writers and i i think some content writers are absolutely going to lose their jobs because content creation, um, certainly that base level content creation is so yeah. easy with AI. Where are the opportunities for those people within this new landscape that we're building? Like, I, I, strategically, you're saying, you know, look at what's happening and position yourselves. But let's talk specifically about what some of those jobs are starting to look like. So I'll kind of address this in two ways. First is kind of the near term, like practically what we're seeing. And then second, I'm going to talk quickly about kind of where one thing, one aspirational role that I think we'll see that in the near future. So first, like what we're seeing is more like AI marketing specialist roles. So you're doing a lot of the same, you're achieving a lot of the same outcomes that you'd be achieving as marketing specialist, copywriter, marketing manager, like those things still matter to do as part of company strategy, you know, creating messages that resonate with your audience, creating content for different channels that follows whatever strategy you're following. All of these things are not generally going away and they're generally not going to be totally automated. But the fundamental way the role has changed is now instead of the human doing all of that work, they're essentially acting as an overseer to a bunch of different tools, machines, or AI assisted approaches and almost like a conductor at an orchestra, right? Like you're going to be more of the conductor in an ideal world versus being the best violinist in the orchestra. At least that's kind of how I see it working. Um, so those AI plus roles are really kind of today what we're seeing. I don't know if I'm seeing, you know, I've definitely seen some like chief or like AI, chief AI officers or like AI strategy officers at the highest level to be like, okay, your dedicated job is helping us figure all this out. At the more practitioner level, it's much more today, the listings I've seen are those AI plus the existing role. But it's not like, hey, be a copywriter and use AI tools to copyright. It's your job as a copywriter is to help us produce all these copywriting outcomes by figuring out a better way to use all these tools together to do it with your kind of unique human skill set and expertise. So you might be honestly doing a lot less creation and a lot more curation and management of outputs from tools, but also, you know, still adding that human element, empathy strategy that the tool itself cannot do. Long, long term, by which I mean, I guess long term in AI is like three years or something. But um, I really could see copywriting being highly valuable as well in terms of, you know, Companies are going to have at some point, if they don't already, and this process might take a few years, their own large language models. I think every company is going to have some version that they've tuned or fine-tuned on their own language, their own content, their own voice. I think you're going to have a natural fit for a lot of copywriting and content people to help maintain and manage and improve those models. Now, I don't know if that'll be through creating content or like, supervising, hey, here's how we're going to further fine tune this. But really, I think all these jobs essentially in one way or another become tech jobs. So what LinkedIn title do I need to give myself to be relevant? Am I, it sounds like AI marketing specialist should be my new LinkedIn title. Is that what uh, Yeah, I think that's a good move. Uh, <laughs> some people use, uh, I, I've seen more and more like not title wise, but skills, you know, prompt engineering and stuff. And that's certainly important to kind of include because people are, do seem to be looking for that. I don't know if that'll be personally, if that'll be a sustainable yeah. role, like moving forward, but certainly an area, I guess, in the short term, you can be like, if you're better at prompting some of this stuff than your clients, I mean, that's really valuable. Okay, we're gonna do lightning round to wrap this up. Um, so I have three lightning round questions. Um, first one, you can answer in any order, but favorite takeaway from Macon. So I was there. It was amazing. Uh, lots of incredible speakers. You were one of them. But was there one takeaway that you're like, this is unexpected, and I'm going to take that with me? 
So that's one. And then the second one is your favorite sci-fi book that you would recommend. So those are two to nice. start us off and I might have a yeah. third one. Yeah, good. I'm glad you stopped because I was like, oh, I need to be writing. <laughs> Can you just remember all those and answer them? Yeah. So favorite book. is I'm really, out. really bad at lightning rounds. I round. really bad at just, lightning rounds. Like, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> There's there, there's some serious AI lightning round skill development. Is this how you know if it's me or a robot? If the robot nails lightning round, it's just it's yeah, not. Yeah, it's, it's the right, right. <laughs> um, so first, Macon takeaway. There were a lot of them, but and I'm not just sucking up to my boss, Paul. Uh, but I really did love this line he gave during his keynote, which we've used more and more, and I like it because it not only put into words something I kind of already intuitively knew, but also makes me really move with urgency and think about this stuff in a new way. And at the end of his keynote, which goes through exactly where we think we're going in the next year, and all these crazy examples of AI tools that have you know, generated human voices, videos, simulated entire worlds, things like this that we already have, he says, this is the least capable AI you will ever use. And that is a really stark reminder. It's a little scary, but it's also a good reminder in my mind to move with urgency and also to think bigger. I mean, I'm, I have to challenge myself. I'm sometimes so in the weeds on how do we use this one tool or improve this one process day in, day out. Sometimes I need to take a step back and say, okay, maybe that's not even the right question to be asking. Maybe there's something bigger to do here, assuming that six months from now, we're going to have something massively more capable. So I'd say that was kind of my big Macon takeaway in a nutshell. Um, favorite sci-fi book. I don't, we don't have enough time to talk through all that. So okay. like, I'm, well, I'm not, I, I would love to read sci-fi. I don't typically gravitate towards sci-fi, but I'm trying. And so for beginners, like, Maybe um, there's a good book. AI sci-fi, like, yeah, entry-level yeah. drug book. Oh, man. All right. None of my picks were entry-level. That's not good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> all right. But, uh, so uh, while you're thinking, uh, I'll give you a second, Mike, to think about it. But, like, one of the very first AIs that I ever read about in uh, sci-fi is from Ender's Game. Uh, oh, and yeah. It's sort of, you know, as part of of the series, it's it doesn't really show up in the very first book, but... Um, this AI that sort of becomes Ender's partner through throughout everything and manages his money so that he's, you know, has all the, the credits or dollars or whatever it is, you know, thousands of years into the future and and ultimately becomes a real entity of some kind, right, at, at some point. So um, that series is is maybe a good entry level drug if somebody wants to. It's, it's a fun series, um, you know, about a uh, a bunch of kids who save the universe and then uh, go on and, and live their lives. And um, there's a great AI character in there. I, I, off the top of my head, I can't remember what her name is, but um, yeah, that, so that would be mine. Yeah. I think that's a, I'm glad you mentioned that. I really like Ender's game. And I think that actually might be a really good sci-fi entry novel because it's not, not like it's simplistic or anything, but it is a very human story. So it's like you're, you've got all this stuff with, technology and, you know, galactic conflict and all that. But it's very human story at its core that like, even if you're just like, I have no conception of what's going on in this universal sci-fi world, you're just like, wow, this is a really great story with really, really memorable characters. So that that's where I'd start. That's a good one. Okay. I've got it. That's great. Um, and last question, just where can uh, our listeners go if they want to learn more from you, from Paul, from your entire team, where should they go? Yeah. So first off, go to marketingaiinstitute.com. You can very easily find all the stuff we've got going on. We've got hundreds of resources on the site, um, kind of choose your own adventure uh, there. I would say if you are in the audience and you work for or run any type of agency or consultancy. We have an AI for Agency Summit coming up in November. It's virtual, but it's a half day of programming around how AI is going to impact the whole like agency and client services world. So if you go to AI4Agencies.com, that's well worth checking out if you're in that world. Um, but if you're not, I would say just go into our on our website, go under resources and click blueprints. We've got a number of different blueprints on AI for different areas of marketing. 
or different industries. So if you work in it, and we're adding to this library all the time, they're totally free. Um, we've got one on content marketing that's worth looking at. We've got some industry focused ones on financial services, higher education and manufacturing. We're adding a ton more in the coming three months or so here. So check out those resources and then I highly encourage people like feel free to reach out and connect with me on LinkedIn. It's just Mike Caput, Chief Content Officer at Marketing AI Institute. Um, I'm happy to chat more about any AI questions you have or any other needs you have around AI. Awesome. awesome. Thanks, Mike. This, is, yeah. this has been really informative, fun discussion. Uh, I love your list of tools. I'm going to go try a couple this afternoon, in fact. So awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's been awesome. Thanks, Mike. We want to thank Mike Caput for joining us to discuss the state of AI in marketing and content creation. Mike emphasized acting with urgency since today's AI capabilities will seem basic in just a few months. He predicts an explosion of AI specialists overseeing tools, as well as the increasing importance of strategic emotional creativity. For free resources or to get details about future events, you can visit marketingaiinstitute.com or if you want to check out what Mike is doing, you can find him on LinkedIn at Mike Caput. And once again, if you want to jump into our AI for Copywriters course, you can go to thecopywriterclub.com forward slash AI4C. That's the end of this episode of AI for Creative Entrepreneurs, a Copywriter Club podcast produced by Brandon Burton. If you've enjoyed what you've heard today, please leave a review of the show on your podcast app so we can reach other creatives who are interested in exploring AI. Or if you're catching this on YouTube, you could always like this video, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment below. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.